Good morning and welcome. And again, a very happy Friday to everybody. We're going to go ahead and make sure that we start on time. We have a lot to cover. As a reminder, you are on mute. If you are not on mute, we are going to mute you until the Q&A portion of the webinar. Thank you so much for taking time out of your days to join us. My name is Sarah Jane Kirkland, and it is an honor to serve as president and CEO of Civic Leadership Institute. We are excited to have such a large audience with us to join us today for this virtual meeting to learn more about the I-64 Innovation Corridor and specifically about the incredible potential we have to become a global internet hub. This event is a collaborative effort between Civic Leadership Institute and RVA 757 Connects, and we are excited to have leaders from across both regions joining us today. I think that that speaks volumes about the importance of regional collaboration and the vision you, our leaders, have for the future. Civic Leadership Institute connects leaders to large scale initiatives where their talents, passions and skill sets can help to make incredible change, inspire creativity and drive innovation. We're excited to celebrate 25 years of programming, and in that time, our network of alumni has grown to over 1,000 executives. Civic was founded in 1996 by a small group of informed and engaged leaders from across the region. Our Civic founders knew that the only way for the region to continue to grow and prosper was to create a strong network, network of leaders with a vision, who trusted each other and that true collaboration was needed. We see civic alumni collaborating every day. The trust and relationships that grow from participating in our program is making an incredible difference. We thank you all for taking the time today to learn more about the important role you have in advancing our I-64 Innovation Corridor as a global internet hub. Thank you to Diane Kaufman, representing Senator Tim Kaine's office, and Drew Lumpkin, representing Senator Warner's office, for being with us today. It's truly an honor to have the very best minds in the industry to come together today to share with you their insight on the true impact this incredible infrastructure has on our local economies and our Commonwealth. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of our presentations. You're going to be prompted to ask questions by typing in the chat function the word question or comment. When we're in the Q&A session, we'll call on you by name and ask you to introduce yourself and state your question. I'd like to hand the virtual microphone over to John Martin, President and CEO for RVA 757 Connect, so he can explain a little bit more about that organization, its priorities, and to share a high-level overview of the session today. John, thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah Jane. And, th and you know, on behalf of everybody on this virtual webinar and uh, across both of our regions, thank you for your leadership. It's just tremendous. Okay, well, let me get started and share a little overview about who we are, RVA 757 Connects. You know, when you think about mega regions, it's kind of a new word for a lot of us, but it's really been going on since the Research Triangle and Boston's Route 128 and Silicon Valley. And over the last 50 years, 11 mega regions have emerged and it's time to put us on the map. And so that's what I wanna share with you on how we're doing that. We started an organization several years ago. It's now a nonprofit, uh, an rva757connects.com, and it includes some of the uh, most prominent leaders in both of our regions, as well as institutions that are responsible for planning across uh, the RVA and 75 regions. Our whole mission is really to improve the economic success and quality of life for everyone in both of our regions. And we do that by being this inclusive, mutually supportive network of leaders community leaders, business leaders, higher education leaders. And what we're trying to leverage is really to uh, identify and support and advance major opportunities, initiatives and projects that, that will actually help both of our communities for generations to come. We are not thinking about merging into one community. We have two wonderful brands with a, centuries of history. What we wanna do though is where we don't have scale, we want to work together. And if we do have scale, then we, well, then we'll compete. But we're trying to find those opportunities that we both win by working closer together. 
So a lot of folks have come together to support us. You can see, recognize many of these uh, brand names that are our funders and many of them on the board. And uh, it has been a real honor to lead this effort uh, and to try to get traction now in a formal way to put us on the, on the mega region map. These are our priorities. We really would want to see the, uh, this idea of being an innovation corridor take root, the I-64 innovation corridor. We want to, uh, we're doing a study right now, a Go Virginia study on what does our talent look like today and our industries and what will that look like in 20 years. We want to accelerate the understanding of our digital connections and we're going to get in that today and and then showcase our members initiatives like the incredible work that Dominion's doing with offshore wind here in the 757. Uh, but the list goes on, the Capital Region Trail, the bike and walk trail that goes from Richmond to Williamsburg, that took 20 years to build. We can't wait for 20 more years to build it from Williamsburg to, to Fort Monroe. We've got to get going uh, and make that happen in a quarter of the time. And more passenger rail service and the widening of 64, we've got 29 miles that aren't funded between the Richmond airport and uh, Williamsburg, we've got to get the money for that. So we have three lanes the whole way between our two regions. Uh, and then we've got a lot of work to do in 2022. We're going to think about uh, uh, helping out with apprenticeships and, and really leveraging some great work our economic development folks are doing on industry clusters. And the global internet hub, this is something that we really see and we hope we convince you in the next hour that this is our transformative moment, that this is something that we really can leverage. So we have a white paper. If you haven't gotten this, we're gonna send it out to you at the end of this uh, webinar, but it, it, it really captures the, the promise of what we're talking about today, uh, of becoming a global internet hub. And there are five things I want you to know as a setup for our speakers. Um, the first one is, that there are many internet hubs. Most of our NFL cities are internet hubs and they're all over the world and they mostly are the big cities. And it's where the carrier networks and the content delivery networks and cloud services, it's where they all choose to co-locate co and interconnect. And once they reach a critical mass, it becomes an internet hub. And there's usually some massive data center at the center of these internet hubs. And you're gonna hear in a second that we have the corner on one of the biggest data centers in the country. So the second thing to understand is that internet hubs come with a tremendous amount of advantages and benefits. We don't understand a lot of them because it's always offered up in, in technical gobbledygook. But when you start to think about it from an economic development standpoint, and really with the benefits, thinking about it from a lay standpoint, you really start to see, oh my gosh, amazing opportunities for businesses to compete with the speed of light advantage. And then our community advantages in terms of filling in that last mile for a lot of underserved neighborhoods, but we're increasing our work from home opportunities. The list goes on and on, and you'll have a copy of these slides to, to look at these for yourself. But the biggest one is the future proofing of the community. Uh, this, we don't know where the future is going to lead us, but I tell you, it's going to be tied together digitally. And so being an internet hub uh, gives you an advantage. And so we want to make sure we're in that column when it comes to the future. So the third one is that large internet hubs become known and officially designated as global internet hubs. And you can see this list here. One interesting thing to note is you can get on this list and move up it pretty fast if you really subscribe to a theory of there's no competition, there's only collaboration. So Marseille, France has really in the last five years become a top 10 global internet hub. I wanna see us on this list in the future. So the fourth thing to know is that it just doesn't happen by accident. Intentionality is what drives getting on the list and moving up the list. And so the industry has identified these 10 factors of success of becoming a global internet hub. And the white paper really goes into each one of these. And more specifically, it shows how well we're doing on delivering on each one of these 10 factors. And that's why we feel the promise of becoming a global internet hub is really within reach. And then lastly, and most importantly, in economic development, there are moments in time where you can transform your region. And in this case, our mega region. And this is one of those we have seen around the world cities go through these different phases and becoming a global internet hub. Don't think of a data center as just having a few jobs within it. It's really the beginning of an entire ecosystem. And we're going to hear Vinay share about this, this process and exactly what this means. But the way I think about it is what I-64 and I-95 did for our region in the 20th century 
becoming a global internet hub will do for us from a transformative perspective in the 21st century. So that's the excitement that we have for this. And we want everybody to get behind it, understand it and support it. And let's all get together and make this happen, becoming a global internet hub. So we are thrilled to have this esteemed group of speakers. And I'll just go from left to right, Vinay Nagpal. He is uh, the CEO of Interglobex and he's a consultant from Ranco County. And we're gonna hear from him and he's gonna share a 30,000 foot perspective on on really becoming a global internet hub. And then Raymond White is with Virginia Beach Economic Development and he has had his finger on the digital pulse of the offshore cables coming ashore and has a, has a lot to say about that and a lot to do with Virginia Beach's uh, internet, internet infrastructure. Then Anthony Romanella, he's the Enrico County Development Authority's uh, president CEO. He heads up the economic development activities of Enrico County and probably somebody that doesn't need any introduction, but we're thrilled to have is Andrea, McClellan and uh, Andrea is, is almost everything. She's with the city of Norfolk, uh, uh, but also has headed up the regional Southside uh, Broadband Network Authority and is now the chair of the PDC. And so Andrea is gonna facilitate our Q&A time and uh, also start with a few comments when we get to the Q&A section. So this is our all-star lineup and we're gonna get started. I'm gonna give you just one more tip. Go to the next slide. Is, your job is to listen for the next 45 minutes, think about questions, and really, as you heard, uh, just go to the chat room and say, you know, question or comment. That's all you have to type, because then we'll call on you. Don't type out your question or comment, but we'll call on you when we get to the Q&A section. But this is your chance, too, to ask questions. And then if you didn't get your question answered, follow up with us, because we'll still answer them, and we'll get back to you an email uh, after the webinar. And then read our white paper. We're gonna send our white paper and we want you to join our cause. So we're gonna convince you that this is gonna be one of the most important transformational moments that you can be part of uh, it, advancing this mega region and our two regions in the process. So with that, let's get started. And uh, let's turn it over to uh, Vinay and uh, take us to 30,000 feet. Absolutely, John. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you, Sarah Jane, for having me here today. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vinay Nagpal, and as John mentioned, uh, I'm the president of Inoglobix, uh, providing global data center and connectivity solutions uh, uh, across various projects around the world. Uh, when, I, when I first heard about this initiative and what John and his team were doing, the first thought that came to my mind was, it's extremely commendable to have that vision and then the ability to bring together so many different facets of the industry, both across public and private sector, and really unify them uh, under a common cause, under a common theme, which is no small undertaking by any means. Uh, and my job here today is, as, as John said, is to kind of to give you uh, a high 30,000 high level uh, overview of what it truly means uh, to be a global internet hub, to give you that global perspective uh, that image you see on my opening slide is one of my favorite, actually, um, and some of you may recognize it. For those who don't, uh, this is actually the, the actual uh, picture of the first subsea cable that landed in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's the Maria cable that comes from Bilbao, Spain, into Virginia, spanning roughly around 6,600 kilometers uh, and co-owned by... Microsoft, Facebook, and uh, Telsius, who is a Spanish telecommunications company. You may look at this picture and be like, you know, what does this cable really look like? And I, I have one in my hand. Hopefully you can see this on the screen. It literally has these fiber strands that are thinner than human hair in which all of our emails, our Facebook posts, our Instagram posts, our video conference like this one uh, is happening and it's happening across the oceans and this uh, subsea fiber cable. So you can imagine, obviously, the importance of these cable systems, which is significant. And, and, and another, thing, another thing I like to start out with is, you know, most of us have fiber in our homes. We, uh, due to the last, uh, you know, a year and a half or two years or so, the situation we have, many of us have had to work from home. If you have Verizon Fios, that's one gigabit per second. This first cable, the picture you're seeing, is 210 terabits per second. To put it in perspective, that Fios connection you have coming in at home, multiply that by 210,000 times in terms of the overall capacity that the system is bringing from 
uh, Spain to, uh, to the Commonwealth of Virginia. And across the system, you can send every movie ever made in high definition in 42 seconds. With that, let's, uh, let's kick it off and to give you a bit more perspective on what's happening at a macro level in terms of you know, the amount of data we are creating, the amount of internet traffic that's growing exponentially by the day, especially during the pandemic. Uh, one interesting stat that I want to start out with is that according to a recent World Economic Forum report, 70% of the new value created in economy over the next decade is going to be based on digitally enabled business models. These days, major corporations like Bank of America, Hilton, Cigna, and others have openly said, if you're not a digital company, you're not a company. In fact, one of the quotes from the CEO of Bank of America is that they're not no longer a bank, they're a digital company. So to give that ability for the consumers to, to be able to operate and carry out the business online is so crucial to the success and to the survivability of their business. Here is the other interesting thing. You think about all the data that's, that's being created. The internet traffic has uh, uh, increased by five times over the last five years. And what, what is astonishing is if you take a step back, that 90% of all the data that exists today, again, 90% is created in the last two years. So give it a thought, you know, and think about where we are headed, you know, whether it's um, edge data centers, we hear about 5G, AI or artificial intelligence, machine learning, connected homes, connected communities, um, you know, healthcare, all of these applications at the end of the day require underlying data. And by end of next year, by one prediction, it said that 4.1 billion people are gonna be online. And in terms of the devices or things as they are called in terms of internet of things, it's anywhere from 20 to 30 billion. I mean, the Delta there of 10 billion, even the predictions and the models that are out there they just can't predict that um, without that variability in terms of how, how fast the uh, adoption of these uh, uh, devices is increasing from an IP enablement perspective. The data center industry itself is growing uh, exponentially as well. Over the next couple of years, it's expected to be a $174 billion industry. Uh, John talked about in his opening remarks, some of the data centers that are in our mega region, which I'll touch upon as well, but that sort of sets the stage. And lastly, in the next four years, globally, the world will get to a point that where we are generating 255 zettabytes of data. Okay, what does it really mean? So for those of us on a regular laptop, which has a one terabyte hard drive, we are talking about 255 billion hard drive equivalent of data generated by all of us on a global basis. Uh, it just sets the stage, gives you a little bit of perspective on the amount of data that's generated, the importance of creating, storing the data. Moving on to the next slide, if you look at the importance of subsea, you know, we hear a lot about, uh, I already talked about the Maria Cable where Microsoft and Facebook came together. They're also building out their mega data centers. As an example, in Henrico, Facebook has a mega data center campus in Mecklenburg County in uh, uh, in Virginia, uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has, uh, you know, their, their campus, they're expanding Facebook and Henrico. So these uh, hyperscalers are also at the same time now investing very actively in subsea cable systems. Why? Because they want to control their own destiny. They want to have more control over their network. Their network services, whether it's, uh, as an example, if you think about, you know, for those of us using Office 365, using Gmail, uh, using, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Teams, those applications utilization is increasing so much that the, uh, the hyperscalers have invested heavily in the subsea cables as well. The ones highlighted are the ones in our region. I talked about Maria. Uh, the uh, Brusa cable is actually owned by Telsys coming from uh, South America and then Dunant coming from France, which is operated by, by Google. Um, so these cables really provide that high capacity, low latency connectivity globally. Uh, the other interesting uh, fact about data centers, John talked about the ecosystem when it comes to job creation. Data centers also are known to consume a lot of electricity. That's very true because they're ultimately housing these servers that are consuming powers, they're dissipating heat. So you need very sophisticated electrical mechanical plants to operate these facilities. Um, and data centers in 2018, consumed 1% of world's electricity. By 2019, it became 3%, and it's anticipated by 2030 in the next uh, uh, eight years or so, it's gonna, the number is gonna be 13%. So 
as you can see, the data center expansion is happening globally uh, alongside with the fiber, uh, fiber systems as well. And the capacity of the fiber system, like the Dunant system is uh, the new one, has even further more capacity than the Maria system put in place. Uh, and then you have the various different ecosystem players that become part of those subsea cable system to harness the advantage of that. Moving on to the next slide, uh, what do these subsea cables truly mean, right? I mean, a lot of times people think that, what about 5G, what about satellite? You know, all of that is important. 5G is important when it comes to cellular uh, devices, when it comes to uh, last mile, but you still need backhaul. Uh, satellites are important for remote area connectivity, but this is an FCC statistic. 99.7% of all international data uh, is traversing on these subsea cables. Oh, these subsea cables are not new, by the way. They've existed for 163 years. And someone the other day was asking me about, you know, my views on the resurgence and how these subsea cables are actively uh, growing so much. So if you think about it, the way I like to explain that is it took 163 years as an industry to have 464 cables, okay, which is what exists today across the oceans of the world. It took four years from 2016 to 2020 to have 107 cables. So if you if you do the math, that's you know, from a proportion perspective, that's a significant growth over a very short period of time, creating approximately $13.8 billion of value creation. Well, it's no, it's not stopping any anywhere soon. Over the next uh, couple of years, another eight billion dollars is expected to be invested in uh, subsea systems. Oh, and by the way, these systems are carrying. $10 trillion, I repeat, $10 trillion of transactions on a daily basis. Uh, to put things in perspective, it's triple of what the US spends on healthcare annually and greater, greater than the combined GDP of Japan, Germany, and Australia. This is again an FCC statistic. I touched upon the hyperscalers and the importance of these hyperscalers, why they're doing it, right, um, is to go hand in hand with where the data is going. But John touched upon the, uh, interconnection hubs or the internet hubs, the importance of that. Uh, moving on to the next slide, what I've tried to do here is kind of give you a visual depiction of where these hubs are. And let's, let me start with the first fundamental question. Who qualifies these as internet hubs? And to John's point, how do we get there? First off, it's um, a very uh, concerted effort by an industry leading firm um, called Telegeography, and they're very well respected across the industry. They're based out of Washington, DC, uh, and they have numerous statistics on internet utilization, uh, bandwidth utilization around the world. You know, one of the things that very obvious is, by the way, of these re the, in this map, as you can see, is many locations are along the coast. Why? Because of subsea. Why is that important? Because that is the way the data is traveling from one continent to the other, from one country to the other, so on and so forth. Marseille. Uh, so um, John touched upon Marseille in his opening remarks. It's my favorite when it comes to an interconnection hub, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But if you look at Europe, if you look at the flap countries, one of the other reasons why you have flap, uh, a flap region, as in Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris, is because of the neutrality of internet exchange that are deployed in that region. What's an internet exchange? In a simplistic way, Internet Exchange is a networking platform that enables Microsoft, Facebook, Cox Communication, Verizon, AT&T to connect with each other and, to, and exchange their internet traffic. Let's leave it at that for now. Let's talk about Marseille for a minute and I'll tell you why it's my favorite. One, I've had an opportunity to visit Marseille twice. Um, let's move on to the next slide. And secondly, when uh, the last time I was there actually, I had an opportunity to meet with the Port Authority of Marseille and and, and, and the proactive work they have done as on the, uh, on the public sector side, working hand in hand with the private sector. So you see Marseille FOS, which is the Port Authority Interaction, which is a data center company, is now owned by Digital Realty. But essentially Marseille is not only the gateway to Europe as explained on the left side of the slide in that graphic, but because of its strategic location, as you can see on the right side, all those lines are actual physical cables underneath water. So what has happened in Marseille? Over time, the public-private partnership, the data center company interaction having a completely open access policy, working closely with the subsea community, working closely with the public sector, uh, has led to 160 networks, 15 subsea cables, 
by way of uh, reference, uh, we have three so far, we have three more coming. Uh, six internet exchanges connecting to 43 countries and 12 CDNs or content distribution networks. Content distribution networks enable faster distribution of content. For example, as a, a CNN, if you go to CNN.com, their content is served by Akamai, which is a content distribution network company. So if you are in Hong Kong, you are getting localized content served um, in a much faster way than if you are uh, in sitting in California, as an example. Then content, pro, content developers like Facebook, like Amazon and others and connecting to multiple continents. Uh, the other element of this uh, in the Marseille ecosystem is data center. So in the next slide, if you see, just to give you a visual depiction, on the very left, you see along the coastline, the work that uh, Port of Marseille has done being proactive. They have actually done extensive bore pipes. They've done extensive um, backhaul and front haul uh, to the cable landing station and interaction has partnered as a data center and interaction continues to grow uh, their data centers, which is shown on the right-hand side picture, just to kind of give you uh, a visual depiction. Okay, now another uh, favorite slide of mine is the next one. A financial uh, industry analyst has compared is Richmond to Richmond to Marseille, saying is Richmond the next Marseille. If you ask me what is the single thing that led to this uh, report, and I have a copy of this, is these subsea cables. So of course, there's a lot of underlying work effort that's already been put in place, but the subsea cables have been the catalyst for the growth of the region. And, and, and even publicly, these reports being published for Richmond to be compared to Marseille. Uh, but before we, deep, deep, uh, before we dig deeper into Richmond, I wanna give you a perspective of what the US looked like before 2017. Uh, on the next slide, we, we saw uh, the global map. Uh, this is again, uh, one of my uh, key slides that I, I, I like to use, that how do you connect the US to the rest of the world, right? On the right-hand side, you see the 10 interconnection hubs. By the way, it doesn't matter who owns these facilities. They are known in the global internet space by their addresses. The two highlighted ones are the ones that are in the, um, in the global list, which we saw. Then you know, you'd ask me, what about the others? What the others are for localized peering that are extremely important. Those addresses, as I said, where peering takes place. Again, peering, what is peering? Internet exchange, exchange of traffic between different uh, providers. So what you see in the oval represented pre-2017 you know, Virginia, as we all know, is a leading data center market in the world and has been so far for actually a few years. Um, but until 2017, did not have a single subsea cable landing there. What did that mean? Well, if someone from, uh, you know, Virginia had to go to uh, London, someone as in, let's talk about the internet traffic, you have to first go through either New York, New Jersey, and you see there are 13 subsea cables uh, connecting to 10 countries, or go to Florida, where the other cables exist. Well, that changed uh, in 2017 when the Maria subsea cable came. And really kind of touching on this at a high level, what happened since then, looking at the next slide, you have Microsoft, Facebook, Telsius partnering, other subsea cables coming. Uh, uh, if you can progress to the next slide, please. And also we see that in addition to the global connectivity provided by these cables, on the very right is another very, very key project. John talked about the importance of I-94 and I-64 I and I-95. Um, most of the US long haul fiber exists on the I-95 corridor of, in terms of north to south, uh, right by the Amtrak. Well, it's dated at, uh, you know, these older systems have uh, capacity constraints. What you see here on the right-hand side is New York to Miami, a brand new system being put in the ocean with uh, connections uh, into Virginia, South Carolina, and another spot in, in Florida, which will, be, which will be great for our industry and for the uh, re regional communities. Uh, back to Virginia, back to Henrico for another minute, right? So John talked about a major data center. If you look at the next slide, I mean, Henrico is uh, known to have both retail and uh, wholesale data centers. At the same time, enterprise data centers of uh, Bank of America, Capital One, and other companies. But uh, you know, Facebook completed their first uh, first leg of deployment recently. Um, the QTS facility is actually one of the uh, world's largest facilities with 1.4 million square feet, and that is what um, became the NAP and the network access point. What does a NAP mean? Let's look at the next slide. Um, as a network access point, and this effort was uh, was initiated by um, 
Clint Hyden from QTS and myself, we co-founded the NAP about four years back. And what you see here is a lot of different logos. What are these things depicting? This is the ecosystem that's already in place in Henrico at the NAP. This is a combination of uh, local network access points. It's an a combination of IP providers, internet exchange providers, including DKIX, which is a global internet exchange, subsea cables, cloud operators, um, and other companies. They've all come together for exchanging traffic and this ecosystem is continuing to build and, and create more jobs, create more economic opportunities and, and helping our region thrive. In fact, over the last four years, the success of this effort has been such that um, Dr. Vint Cerf, who I was uh, talking about earlier, um, you know, before we opened the uh, panel in our, uh, during our prep session, in the next slide, if we can uh, uh, progress uh, to the next one, he is one of the founding fathers of the internet call as the father of the internet. He, he sort of invented the TCP IP protocol, how the internet works. Uh, he's currently Google's chief internet evangelist. He's supporting us on this effort because he's recognized that our region has that potential to uh, develop into a global internet hub uh, over the next few years. Oh, 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 by the way, uh, by end of this year, it's anticipated that 18% of all East Coast traffic is gonna be passing through our region. In 2017, it was zero. So imagine in four years, zero to 18%, that is a very significant traffic pattern shift. Uh, and over the next few years, the list you see on the left is kind of showing the other pro projects in, in progress and how our region will continue to develop. So this effort uh, led to the formation of Internet Ecosystem Innovation Committee shown on the next slide, which is an effort, uh, it's a global effort, but it's a, it's, a, it's a regionally developed global effort is what I'd like to call. Um, the founder is Clint Hyden, as I mentioned earlier, I co-founded the NAP with him uh, from QTS. But then you see from these companies and the leaders, you see healthcare industry, you see financial services sector, you see hospitality industry, you see automotive industry. This effort spans across multiple industries, multiple businesses. Uh, and we have come together to really use Henrico as a blueprint and, and even help other regions around the world for growth of uh, these global hubs and uh, and develop ecosystems. So by virtue of that, you know, um, we were talking about getting our region on the map. And I have some news to share if we move to the next slide. In December of uh, last year, we actually were successful in getting uh, our region on the global connectivity map. What you see here is a depiction of uh, a global interconnection platform uh, and subsea cables have been a catalyst for that. Public-private partnership is key. And, and really this becomes a stimulus for growth. It's an economic growth engine for the region. And I sincerely hope and believe that we kind of continue to come together with efforts like this and applaud what John is doing in growing that further. By the way, when was the last time you heard Richmond, New York, Chicago, and Dallas, uh, and Phoenix is a new market added in the same sentence, right? And connecting to the rest of the world. So you'll hear more about that from Anthony to whom I'm gonna pass it over. Before I do that, I wanna show you my, my uh, another interesting picture, which is on my last slide. This is actually a subsea cable being rolled into a ship. And all those people you see there are actually by hand, they, are, they, they roll the cable there before the ship takes off from the coast and starts deploying it across thousands and thousands of kilometers. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Anthony. Thank you, Vinay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, one of the problems with Vinay is that he's just not enthusiastic enough about the work that, uh, that we do. So Vinay, thank you so much for that, uh, for that setup. And uh, I will uh, get the presentation there on the on the screen. So today I want to take you on a journey that will build on uh, Vinay's presentation, but you don't need a plane ticket or a passport. There's no TSA and no traffic lights. This journey touches all corners of the world in fractions of a second. I'm going to talk about reach and about data speeds and about business opportunity. So what can our region's internet infrastructure do to revolutionize business and be the fiber of our digital transformation? So this is our world, the world we used to do business in. And you can see that it's vast, it's disconnected. 
defined by distance and limited by time. This is the business world of today. Thanks to the integration with DKIX, as Vinay mentioned, the world's leading provider of interconnection services, and RICO in our business community is in the same conversation with New York, Chicago, Dallas, and Phoenix, even without, as John Martin points out, even without an NFL team. And we're part of the largest internet ecosystem in North America. So what does that mean for businesses over and above heightened visibility on an international stage? A premier global data hub right in our backyard. The world gets closer because data can go farther and faster. We're talking data communications with business ep epicenters in emerging markets worldwide in milliseconds. Anthony, I, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback when you're speaking. I'm wondering whether it might be um, beside your microphone there. I think everyone was just having some challenges hearing you there for a moment. Okay. Sorry you, to interrupt. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's okay. Usually people don't complain when they can't hear me. So thanks for pointing that out. This is all made possible by leveraging our existing subsea cable connections located at the QTS NAP uh, in Richmond. For years, Henrico has been cultivating our data center infrastructure for the benefits of our business, for the benefit of our business, and the QTS NAP is a prime example. Over and above data center and terrestrial networks, the Richmond NAP offers subsea cables, as Vinay mentioned, that extend to Puerto Rico, Brazil, Spain, France, and soon Africa. The Denant cable from QTS Richmond NAP through Virginia Beach to France is 250 terabits per second, fast enough to transmit every word in the Library of Congress three times across the Atlantic, three times a second across the Atlantic. But it gets better. Because this is the business world of tomorrow, through integration of the QTS NAP and the DKIX exchange, businesses will have instantaneous access to more than 2,300 networks and 500 data centers across the globe. And that list is growing. And what's more, integration with DKIX means data center, data carrier neutral and carrier neutral connectivity, which means you aren't dependent on one carrier or one data center to help transmit your data. It's open access and unrestricted. The benefits are far reaching, including more reliability, increased flexibility, cost savings, lower latency, and a decrease risk of data loss. And all of this is at unimaginable speeds because it matters. We live in a world where milliseconds can mean the difference between being a, a leader in your business and being in that business at all. The TAB group did an interesting study looking at brokers where it estimated what would happen if a broker's electronic pl trading platform was just one millisecond behind his competitors. And what they found was that it could cost up to $4 million per millisecond. Let's put that in real world context. If you will, for just a minute, blink your eyes. Just take a second, blink your eyes. That was a third of a second. In that same amount of time, you just sent your data to Spain and back. Now take a sip of your afternoon beverage, whatever it might be. Before you've even touched your cup or your water bottle, two milliseconds, to be exact, you could have reached 80% of America's population within two milliseconds. That is if your business is located in the RVA 757 region. We're offering open access to a data Autobahn where you can drive your business towards success. So in summary, our, regionals, our region's digital infrastructure provides expanded global reach, data resiliency, and connectivity at hyperspeeds and an internet infrastructure that's robust to support today's digital age, and we believe to take us to tomorrow. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Raymond is next. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, certainly a pleasure to be part of the group today, and I'd like to thank Civic and uh, also RVA 757 for uh, including us in this panel. Um, I'd like to kind of uh, build upon what Vinay and uh, Anthony uh, has shared with you and Virginia Beach's role in all of this within the Commonwealth and Virginia and uh, also the mega region area of RBA and 757. Um, 
the three of the cables, as you've seen on several of the, uh, of the um, slides that have been presented, uh, land right here in Virginia Beach. We started to get, to get involved uh, with this industry. I guess it's been about seven uh, going on eight years uh, ago when uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, uh, Telefonica, uh, and, and then Google uh, contacted us uh, indicating that they felt Virginia Beach was a great site for center of the East Coast to bring the latest and greatest uh, cables uh, into uh, the uh, East Coast of the US. Uh, and since then, we've worked with them. Uh, we've landed the three cables as mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the land uh, at, at our shore at the Camp, P Camp Pendleton uh, or Camp Pendleton area. And uh, then they run about three miles in shore to our corporate landing business park where Telsius, uh, basically uh, all of this infrastructure from these cables come into the Telsius facility. Again, this is about three miles uh, from the coast where uh, it comes in. And uh, those sites are secure. They're uh, outside of a hundred year floodplain. So there's no issues regarding that uh, high and dry and certainly will be for for decades and decades to come. Uh, from there, uh, we've got the carriers, uh, our, our main carriers here are Verizon, uh, Cox, uh, Segra, uh, and uh, also CenturyLink. Uh, we are getting uh, calls uh, almost on a every other week basis of other folks that will take these signals and interested uh, and taking them down to Raleigh or to Henrico, Richmond area, or uh, ultimately up to Ashburn. So there's been a lot of activity on that front. From these cables coming in also, uh, we have uh, partaked and uh, have uh, started some data center activity. Global Links was the first one uh, here in Virginia Beach to open, and they've been open uh, several years now. Uh, point one uh, has uh, uh, started construction uh, on their data center and, and NAP. And uh, right now we're probably, uh, well, we've got four uh, entities of data centers that are have inquired and have tied up land in Virginia Beach to build those uh, in the months ahead. So uh, a lot of activity on that. Uh, and uh, nearby our corporate landing park, uh, there's about 500 other acres uh, that are just uh, right across a, a main corridor. Uh, those areas are, uh, again, potential for uh, data centers and uh, have uh, garnered a lot of interest in that particular area. And, uh, and then we've also are in the process of open up, opening up another site for data centers uh, that are uh, uh, just a few miles away. Now, um, there's several unique things that we have in Virginia Beach uh, besides being on the coast. But uh, one of those is, uh, many of you may have heard, there's going to be uh, two major offshore wind uh, projects uh, that will start construction in 2024, just a few years from now, and be completed by uh, 2026. One of those is by Dominion Energy, that certainly many of you uh, here in the Commonwealth know about. Uh, and the other is just south of our border uh, in the Kitty Hawk uh, the Kitty Hawk project. Both of those uh, powers will be landing in Virginia Beach. Both of them have been talking uh, to the data center companies uh, that we have and that we are working with right now to locate here. And uh, one of the key trends within this industry is uh, for these data centers to start running on alternative energy. And again, we think we're uh, in a prime position to, uh, uh, to do so. Um, also uh, want to mention uh, a key aspect, we've got all this data running here uh, from uh, France, from Spain, from South America. Uh, obviously, you've got to keep that secure. And uh, one of the major assets we have in our region outside of Northern Virginia, we probably have one of the highest concentrations of cybersecurity companies uh, in the country. Um, and uh, mainly that's due to the military. And uh, you, people that are familiar with Hampton Roads certainly know we have a lot of that. And uh, an, another potential opportunity for us is not only with the commercial traffic uh, of data from all over the world, 
uh, but from the federal government. I um, was just reading a report the other day that uh, uh, you know the, the federal data centers are going through a massive change right now. Their technology is, is old. They've shut down uh, over 6,000 of their data centers over the last few years. And again, are gonna have to replace this with new modern facilities. Uh, we feel uh, being located in Virginia Beach, there's a tremendous opportunity to get some of, of uh, that uh, data center activity here in our area. Um, and with all the military we have, uh, certainly connectability, uh, low latency would be, uh, would be a key aspect of that. In addition, one exciting thing uh, that's uh, underway now that we've been working on for the last year or so has been uh, additional sites that it's gonna come available in our Naval Air Station Oceana area. And uh, uh, what's happening with them is that, uh, you know, the military, uh, especially from their facility standpoint, is just not getting enough from the federal government uh, to operate properly as, as far as support services are concerned. Uh, their mission certainly is, is the dollars are going there, uh, but the barracks, the supporting facilities that help there are, are just not getting enough money and is putting them in a tremendous uh, stressful situation. So uh, those of you that are familiar with Oceana, there's about 1,200 acres uh, around the non-essential area that the Navy owns. And uh, right now we're working with a program called Future Base Design that will allow uh, development uh, in these, uh, what could some would consider excess area uh, around the, uh, the key aspect of those bases. Now, uh, you can't put high density there because of the aircraft coming in and all, uh, but uh, businesses such as data centers, uh, such as uh, warehousing, distribution, logistics, are ideal to locate uh, in these areas. And what does that provide for data centers? Extra security, because you've got the Navy all around it. Uh, some of these data centers can be built uh, inside uh, what's known as the, uh, the surrounding fence of the base to added extra security. So we feel we've got a, a, a lot of opportunity, a lot of upside here in Virginia Beach. We certainly play our role uh, as far as the cables coming in. And right now uh, there's, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, the confluence cable uh, is in the process and we hope in the next few years that will be here. And uh, we're also uh, talking with potentially four other cables. Uh, that could land here in the next three or four years. So exciting time in Virginia Beach. Uh, I think a lot of upside and uh, we've got a key role to play uh, along with the greater Richmond area and also Northern Virginia to ensure the growth of this industry moving forward. With that, I'll turn it over to John Martin. Yep. Wow, Raymond, thank you so much. And Vinay mm -hmm. and Anthony, uh, I learned something every time you guys talk and I, I see all those connections happening. And at first I was wondering, God, don't we just want to keep this for ourselves? And you guys have taught me, look at Marseille and the more lines that move around and connect around us means we, we climb up the rank. And that means that we have other companies come in here to take advantage of that access. So really exciting. Now we're going to turn to Andrea, who is um, really going to open up with a few comments. And, and everybody in the Hampton Roads area knows Andrea for my Richmond friends. Um, this is really kind of the uh, a really dynamic leader. And uh, one of the roles that Andrea plays is vice chair of the Southside Network Authority, which I, I'm sure Andrea will talk about. So Andrea, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you, John. I'm honored to be here with you guys. I, I love this topic and it's so exciting to think of this as a mega region topic. I, I can't think of anything that fits more appropriately, to be honest with you. And uh, as John mentioned, in addition to serving on, on the Norfolk City Council, I serve as vice chair of the Southside Network Authority. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, this is a, a partnership uh, of five cities that includes Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Portsmouth, Suffolk, and Chesapeake. And we have uh, created this authority to launch a regional fiber network ring. Uh, in our first phase, we will be about 110 mile highway of fiber that will connect to our subsea cables and connect these five cities. Uh, the second phase will move over to the peninsula and join our friends there. And in the third phase, we'll move to Western Tidewater. Uh, the goal of the ring is to take advantage of everything that you've just heard here today. 
Um, I love what's happening in the greater Richmond area and in Henrico. Uh, bravo. Uh, I want to see the 757 on that same map. And we don't uh, want to miss out on the great things coming through Virginia Beach. Uh, we want to be part of that. We want to be part of that mega region. So essentially what this authority will do, and as for time frame standpoint, we are right now in the process of reviewing RFPs. Uh, we expect to make a decision moving forward sometime in, by October, November, so imminently, uh, and hope to be uh, in process of breaking ground and by the first quarter of 2022 and look to get that first phase finished by 2023. The authority then either we will or if we have a public private partnership will lease out our excess capacity. The goal is to have um, uh, three uh, conduit paths as part of uh, this fiber ring. We'll in the first initial path it'll have 288 strands and essentially, in addition to connecting all of our municipalities and our, our municipal buildings and schools uh, for our own internet usage, the authority looks to basically take that excess capacity and provide that for no other business opportunities to, to light up our region. We think it's gonna be transformative uh, from an economic development standpoint. I see a couple of my friends on here from the Port of Virginia. When we think of the port, we've often th we think about moving goods. We're moving data. And what we look forward to is the opportunity to become the digital port of the East Coast and of the world and to become a global internet hub. Uh, so with that, I will open it up to some questions uh, to my panelists. And, and let's, let's start with what could we do as a region, um, as elected officials to expedite and to ensure that we in, become that global internet hub similar to Marseille? Um, I, I don't know, Benet, if you have some thoughts on that, or I'll open it up to others as well. Sure, Andrea, thank you. A um, couple of things that come to mind, Andrea, uh, uh, are one is obviously when you think about, you know, subsea cables, landing of subsea cable uh, is a pretty complex process in itself. It requires various layers of feasibility study analysis that has to be done. Um, and some of those studies, as you, as you know, have been undertaken already for our region. Uh, the subsea industry itself uh, tries to look for uh, support from the, um, um, from, the, from the public sector when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, licensing and permitting. Um, so there's, there's that element. The second element, which I, was, which I touched upon in my presentation, was related to Port of Marseille. When I was talking about the proactive approach the port did and took in terms of uh, you know, and, and Raymond touched on that a little bit in terms of evaluating other landing sites, uh, would it make sense to have uh, uh, ocean, uh, bores, uh, you know, going into the ocean and have the backhaul, so both the front hall in terms of going to the ocean, the backhaul connecting back to a landing site uh, in terms of what exists today. Uh, so I think those kind of efforts go a long way in terms of giving the message, uh, Andrea, to the subsea community that as a region, we understand your requirements. We want to work with you. Obviously, you know there is an element of capex deployment there, which can be, uh, which can be managed in a number of different ways. But I think that business-friendly environment, that uh, forward-looking thought process, uh, would go uh, would go a long way. Great, and Raymond. Yes, uh, I'd like to add a couple of things. Uh, uh, regarding landing sites, we're in the final stages of opening up another landing site in Virginia Beach uh, in the Sandbridge area uh, right now. Uh, we've got the state approval for that, and uh, we will officially probably be announcing something in, in probably the next month or two that we'll be able to do that. So that allows us to take in uh, more cables, and I think that's certainly going to be a positive, not only for the Hampton Roads region, but for the entire Commonwealth. Um, also lower taxes. Uh, that's a key thing that these companies look for. Also, uh, we have uh, drastically lowered our taxes for uh, data centers that uh, look to locate uh, into uh, Virginia Beach. Uh, we also, the first two years from a licensing standpoint, have put a cap of $50 a year. So that uh, is a tremendous savings uh, to companies uh, to, uh, again, look at us seriously uh, to come in to expand their business and to provide uh, more revenue for our community. And uh, certainly uh, the, the last thing uh, that would be key, 
uh, is uh, alternative energy. And I touched on that earlier. More and more the data centers are looking for the alternative energy aspect. And with six, uh, potentially six gigawatt, uh, gigawatts coming in totally, that's just gonna be a massive advantage uh, to be able to uh, provide those services to these data centers. That's great, Anthony. Yeah, Raymond is uh, Raymond is spot on. The only thing, I, and, and Vinay, the only thing I would uh, I would add is that uh, you know every overnight success is twenty years in the making, and and what we're seeing is the investments that have been made over time through public private partnerships, uh, through the infrastructure at the beach uh, in Central Virginia and elsewhere is positioning us to become that global internet hub. If we the fourth largest data center in the world, which is the QTS data center that you saw in Vinay's presentation, that used to be a chip manufacturing plant that has been completely uh, converted uh, when we um, stopped making chips during the Great Recession. Now we're hoping to be making chips again in the United States. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, our economy in our region has really had to pivot. I think that the key for all of us is to do what we can to accelerate that so we don't have to wait another 20 years to be a global internet hub. And I think that's really our challenge is to make sure that we are moving just as quickly as possible to, uh, to get to be that global internet hub. Great, so we have, um, I mentioned the Southside Network Authority. If you wanna learn a little bit more, you can go to southsidenetworkauthority.com for our website. It's um, got some good Q and A there, uh, but we're at the very beginning stages of this journey still. Uh, as we think about it, I mentioned economic development is, is the driver here beyond data centers. How can we attract companies, businesses to locate here, to grow here? Um, and, and what are those industry sectors that we should be targeting? Bene? So I think um, I'll take your first part of the question first um, in terms of how can we help attract com companies? I think the key there is to articulate what all of this infrastructure means, Andrea, from a uh, business owner's perspective, you know, I own a, a small business or a large business, I want to come to the area. I think, I think articulating the value proposition that why do these subsea cables matter? Why does additional, even terrestrial fiber uh, network that's being deployed? I mean, you look at companies like NBC, which is uh, Mid-Atlantic Broadband Communities, Tad Durst and his team, they're doing a phenomenal job in adding more uh, physical uh, terrestrial fiber networks uh, along along the region, um, you know, in, in our area. What does it really mean? It gives them more uh, more connectivity option. What does this DKICS mean? Like, you know, people who, with all due respect, don't 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 know. Uh, I think it's important that the value proposition of a global interconnection platform, in case of DKICS, that by exchanging traffic in a neutral platform, there's low latency, um, high capacity. Um, scalable, scalable access uh, to, to perform your business, you're getting those options which were not there in a completely neutral way. I think, I think Andrea, those are some of the th thoughts that come to my mind um, instinctively from a, uh, how we articulate that to the businesses. What type of businesses? I, I think the best way I can explain that, and I will not take much credit for it at all, it's the Internet Ecosystem Innovation Committee slide that I had showing you the variety of um, uh, enterprise sectors who have come together and forming that coalition because they recognize that their end users are dependent on this infrastructure. This infrastructure matters to their business, right? So I would say, you know, from, I mean, obviously, and we have seen this, uh, unfortunately, very up close and personal during the pandemic, whether it's, uh, you know, kids' education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's banking sector, the, the reliance on the digital infrastructure is such that it's not going to go. There's no go. There's no going back to the to the old days. There's only progression, and I consider even this is a progression in life that you're progressing further towards enhanced digital infrastructure. So I think I think the answer to the second part is pretty simple. It spans across all industries. Right. Right. Anthony, you have any uh, additional thoughts or comments there? Uh, you know, I, I would just add, I think our, our region, our regions are uh, really well positioned uh, from a pharma life sciences standpoint, from a corporate headquarters uh, standpoint, uh, from uh, fire, you know, finance and insurance to, to grow the companies that we have and to, and to bring in others from places maybe where the weather isn't so good or where they're high tax or, or heavy burdens or they're not right to work states. And I think that now that we've, we've proven in the last 18 months that knowledge workers can work from anywhere in the world, 
Why not work from Virginia Beach? Why not work from Central Virginia where your taxes are going to be lower and the traffic is, is not as bad as it is as in, uh, in most of America? What we've done here in, in the, uh, we're beginning to do here in the Richmond area is to completely rethink our marketing strategy. We used to have a tourism marketing strategy and the Chamber of Commerce had a marketing strategy and economic development had a marketing strategy. We're now aligning that because we need to market to workers, not to companies because it's workers that are driving this new economy, not the, the corporations. And so that's one of the things in the past 18 months that is a real sea change for us. And I think that we are our own worst enemy. The last thing we wanna be is anybody's best kept secret. Imagine if we could put a sign, a blue badge on every major highway in our region that said digital, digital highway, digital infrastructure, just like you see for 64 and 95, we should cover those signs because everybody knows where the roads are and talk <laughs> about digital infrastructure just so every corporation, everybody who's been in business is telling this story. Hey, John Martin, I think Anthony yes. is reading from your playbook. I think so, too. I've heard that. I've heard you say those a few, there, a few times. There's a lot of, yeah, John, what you started with is getting a lot out. of play between, between highways and digital and digital highway. So, John, John, you're clearly on to something here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to, to add to them and, and all yeah, those are great points. Uh, you know, the, the labor force is, is obviously critical when you're talking about any kind of economic development. And particularly uh, in our region, we've got tremendous assets from the exiting military. Uh, you know, a lot of the latest and greatest technology uh, starts with the military uh, and, and the high tech firms. And if we can retain that military workforce here uh, that are working on this cutting edge technology, that's going to be a tremendous asset force. Uh, students between uh, the Richmond area and uh, Hampton Roads, uh, we've got, uh, you know, a lot of great university talent and all, but we've got to keep them here. We've got to keep them in our area, uh, keep them out of Atlanta, out of the D.C. area uh, and, and the like. So we've really got to work hard and that's going to be a tremendous asset force, too. Uh, relating uh, to the type of uh, industries, uh, uh, financial and, and healthcare in particular would, would be of great advantage uh, for uh, data and, and for uh, uh, expeditiously uh, providing data from, from not only within our region, but from all over the world, collaborations. Uh, we have started a bio initiative uh, here in Virginia Beach. And uh, one of the key things is uh, through the um, subsea cable and through the data centers, they can collaborate with people all over the world to help develop and to help bring their product to market. So that's key also. Uh, another thing that has drastically changed, especially during a COVID, has been warehousing, distribution, and logistics. Uh, no longer uh, do we have to go out to the, the retail stores when we want things during COVID. It's coming to us. And we're just getting tremendous interest from those type of companies. And again, communication is a big part of, of move, moving products within regions and around the world. So just wanted to uh, add those things as I think are, are key to our success too. Thank you. And I, I just want to say thank you to our panelists and all those who are watching. We're going to continue on. I know we're we're past uh, 1230, but hopefully everybody, this has been such a robust conversation. And I know we've got some questions here. I wanna make sure to get to some of the folks in our Zoom audience. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Porter Brannon. Uh, Sarah Jane, can you work your magic and or Amesa and pop up Dr. Brannon so she can ask her question? Good afternoon. Uh, I was curious, like this question could, for any panelist, but I think it, it was in response to um, a comment that Anthony had mentioned um, around the offshore wind opportunities that are that are emerging. One of the things, and, and sorry, I'm, I'm the president at Thomas Nelson Community College. So this is a it's, it, the question is about preparing the workforce um, around these emerging fields and offshore wind is, is one of them. Uh, and we have been in contact with the industry to decide how we're gonna prepare that labor force. And so a lot of the uh, areas where we're being asked to help prepare talent for are the, um, the skilled trades. And so, and that's fine. That's what some of the things that community colleges do well, but you mentioned technology. And I'm a technology, like I'm an old school tech girl. And so I'm always thinking technology is one of those things that 
no industry will be able to avoid. And I'm trying to figure out how we prepare students for the technology that's going to be needed to support offshore wind. And so you mentioned, I think you mentioned data or information science and even cybersecurity. Uh, so for our students, we want to help prepare them with careers that lead to a further advancement and skills trades is a nice start, but not enough. Uh, and so when we think about attracting more people, not only to that industry for offshore wind, but also to education, uh, I think technology is something that would attract um, many more students or even retired veterans or, you know, a different population. So I was curious um, about what other, um, what other technological fields should we be preparing students for specifically to offshore wind, but in any of the fields that you see emerging, I was just curious as to what your advice may be. So Dr. Brandon, I'm, I'm actually going to take that one. I serve on the state offshore wind task force and I'm working with Sean Avery on the Hampton Roads workforce council. Um, and through the PDC, we actually are trying to get legislation and a $30 million package to deal with offshore wind workforce development pipeline, um, and supply chain. Um, so I think this, that, that one though, and I could talk about that could another, another hour and a half. I think that one might be a little bit off the, I mean, I think, listen, what we're getting here are, um, technology for offshore wind is technology for, as mentioned, healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, advanced manufacturing, FinTech, right. um, all of those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I, I think our community colleges are that, that workforce development training is really, really critical. Um, and also just even laying these cables, right? Even, um, you know, putting the infrastructure, good gracious, you can't, um, you can't turn a page of the, you know, American Rescue Plan Act or all the infrastructure bills without hearing mm -hmm. something um, about broadband um, and all these projects and all these dollars that are going to go into that work. And I'm worried about the supply chain and having the workforce to even do the, just putting it in the ground. Um, so, Anyway, uh, Vinay, um, Raymond, Anthony, anything else? And when you think about from a community college perspective, what could our community colleges be doing and how can they take advantage of the opportunity of, the, uh, of being a global internet hub? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, Andrea. Um, so I, I'm part of uh, NVTC, Northern Virginia Technology Council, and no, it's not restricted only to Northern Virginia. I'll start by saying that. Um, we, have, uh, we have a new leadership uh, uh, at the uh, um, Technology Council, and uh, I serve uh, on the Data Center and Cloud Committee. I'm also in full, full disclosure part of the Executive Circle, and we have sort of partnered with uh, the, the NOVA Community College in putting together a program uh, for data center infrastructure. You know, there's a lot of, obviously, if you look at typically on the computers and the computer slash IT industry, uh, you know, instinctively you think about programming and languages and application development and software, then you have the hardware segment, but when it comes to infrastructure and that sort of things or product management, there's not a lot of, a lot, lot of emphasis on that. So I think, I think the more support we can get from the education sector, from the community colleges, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us as being part of the industry to spearhead that effort and, um, and, and, and further facilitate such programs through community colleges where we improve the awareness of the importance of digital infrastructure, but at, at the same time, prepare the leaders for tomorrow, right? I mean, we're all gonna be working and doing what we're doing till a certain period of time. So I think it's, I think it's always good to, uh, for us to tread that waters and that's what we have actually done um, uh, here in Northern Virginia, we have a four-year program in place. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, now already. I want to recognize uh, Dr. Corey McRae, uh, who has his hand raised and is a fellow civic board member. Um, Dr. McRae, would you like to make a couple comments also representing uh, Tidewater Community College? No, um, Cam, so I'm serving. So hello, everyone. Thank And thank you, Andrea, for that introduction. I am currently serving as the interim president here at Camp Community oh. College. And so, yeah, so- That's so even better. So, <laughs> thank you for that. So here's my question. I'd like to echo my colleague, Dr. Porter, uh, Brandon, uh, around workforce development and the like. One of the things that has been somewhat of a challenge for us um, as community colleges and workforce development entities is, are, um, you know, we, we are very responsive, but the challenge sometimes happens when we 
get the uh, signal just before the demand mm. is, is high, right? And so my question is how can industry work with community colleges to really have some runway when we know that there is an impending demand such that we can get a head start on developing this pipeline of talent and sustaining it, even engaging our K-12 partners uh, and thinking about how we build a sustainable pipeline of qualified workers. So we know that wind is coming. We know, you know, you can't drive around Hampton Roads without recognizing the infrastructure work and the continued demand for infrastructure. Um, we're in all these discussions, but sometimes it feels like there's not a real way of getting out in front of it, building that talent, establishing a pipeline that can be sustained and we ready when we start putting more off, more, more wind turbines out and, and the like. So how, how can we do this collaboratively to, to really attract and maintain and, and prepare the workforce? Oh, uh, I'd, I'd like to address that one. And uh, great, great to see you. Uh, and, and we work really close with Virginia Beach, uh, uh, TCC campus and, and, and Mike Summers, out there has, has, has been traditionally a, a great asset for us. And uh, there's there's things happening right now on the offshore wind aspect uh, with the city and economic development uh, working with TCC, uh, again, on the training of these folks within the uh, offshore wind, but also from the technology standpoint. Uh, uh, you know, we've been, uh, again, about eight years on the subsea cable now. Uh, we've certainly uh, been in touch uh, uh, cluing in TCC and also uh, working with our Advanced Technology Center, which is a collaboration between our Virginia Beach uh, uh, public school system and TCC. So uh, I, I think certainly uh, keeping that line of communication open uh, and growing that line of communication uh, it is a key factor. And, and again, uh, we're more than willing to uh, continue and grow that. And uh, certainly there's folks that meet on a regular basis uh, with the community college uh, in the city to ensure uh, that you're uh, playing uh, the role and a gigantic role it is uh, in making sure we get the labor force ready for these great opportunities. Great questions. I think we um, I, I just say kudos to our partners in the community college space. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, and I, I think we hear you loud and clear. You need to be sitting at the table as we're having these discussions. Mm -hmm. So so thank you there. Um, we've got several questions coming in, so I'm gonna try and get around to everybody. Um, I, I wanna go now uh, to Marla. And Marla, I'm gonna mispronounce your last name, Shookman. Um, if you could ask your question and welcome. Hi, Andrea. Uh, so I just wanted to comment um, to Dr. McCray. I think one of the best ways that you can find out what's in the pipeline is start talking to the companies that are actually going to be hiring more than just you know deciding what technologies are coming but actually talk to them about specific roles that they're designing for right now so something that comes to mind is um, back end and front end design which i know you probably already have some training programs in but that is um i know something that's really needed so i just moving from that i i guess the reason i want to question or the reason i want to comment is that um I'd like to stress thinking about growing and supporting local, locally founded companies, local entrepreneurs. I come from the entrepreneurship world. Um, so it's one thing to fish in other ponds and find companies to come here, but it's really important to fish from our own pond. And as Ray mentioned, you know, get that cycle going where we're growing our own. And um, I just want to know from whoever can answer this, from a government standpoint, from a local you know, business standpoint, what direct support, grants, um, incentives, lowering of barriers for registration, permitting, licensing, you know, talking with real estate owners, anything that's going to make it easier for an entrepreneur to take advantage of this new infrastructure. Um, I, I guess I'm curious, you know, how is, how is this effort to make a mega region aligned with, you know, the individual who actually wants to do something? 
So Marla, um, I would real quickly, a couple of things. Once we have our Southside Network Authority lit up um, and we have the opportunity for people to come in and, and tap into that, that's where, you know, that'll be the sort of 2023. So we need to be talking about that for sure. Um, certainly, I know this. all of our cities in the South Side support 757 Angels and 757 Accelerator. Um, and I know that um, there are other opportunities to, to support our entrepreneurs, but I, 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 we absolutely have to grow our own. Um, so, so thank you for that reminder that we shouldn't just be looking elsewhere. I think the other opportunity is we also need to be thinking about our boomerang folks like myself. I grew up here and then I left and I worked in LA and New York and Philadelphia and I returned. And I think there's a lot of talent around the United States um, that could come back to our mega region if they knew the opportunities um, as well. So Anthony, you had something to say. Yeah, I just, I think Marley, you're asking a great question. I think one of the challenges we have in Virginia is that we have a 20th century incentive system in a 21st century economy. And, and so it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to pivot. If, if somebody comes in with a hundred million dollar investment and a thousand employees, we are all over it. We, we can do that in a, in a minute. But to support the entrepreneurial community, it's really, and, and just what Andrea was saying, and, and there's very similar efforts um, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Lighthouse Labs and with the 1717 Center and others uh, in, the, in the Richmond area, just as you all are doing in Hampton Roads. And a lot of those are homegrown. Some of them have a little bit of state funding, a little bit of Go Virginia funding. Most of them really are relying on corporate funding uh, to get it done because the corporations see the benefit of supporting entrepreneurs. And I, I would just say that I think we have a whole lot more work to do in that regard, particularly to help small businesses and entrepreneurial businesses uh, bubble up and to be part of our economy. I think what, what we've got with the technology and that we're gonna have in our region uh, is really going to assist them. But in terms of getting them started, we've got work to do. I wanted to yeah. just make one response real quick and that we haven't, I haven't heard spoken about some of the major tech talent nexuses on the peninsula, which is exactly in the middle of this region. You know, we've got NASA and Jefferson Lab. And I think both of those organizations and also their, you know, the structures that support them can be making a more creative effort to support using this new resource, right? You know, if you are working on spinning people out, you're working on the tech transfer, you're working on the communications between the institutions, then you're creating those connections and possibly the new companies that are going to take advantage. So I have to say, uh, Marla, you did a great job of teeing up our next question, uh, which comes from NASA. Um, so Julie Williams Bird uh, had a question as well. Um, and uh, Nice shout out to, um, to NASA and what's going on at Jeff Labs. Julie, can you ask your question? You're still here. Yes, I'm still here. Thank you very much, um, Andrea, for allowing me to ask these questions. And I just wanted to tell the, um, the panel, thank you so much for your information. This is really exciting uh, capability that we're gonna be able to develop here in this area. And I, I wanted to, one quick comment, I wanted to tell Vignette, I appreciate the the zeta bytes of information, which really stretches our imagination and allows us to think very, very innovatively of, of what the possibilities could be for the, for the data that we have. Uh, I am the center chief technologist at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton. So I'm really excited about this. And I'm also a, a civic alum, class of 2020, the best and most resilient class because <laughs> we went through COVID. But um, my question, so that was a comment. And again, thank you for the panelists. And so I have a, I have a, a, a Zeta byte worth of questions, but I'm gonna narrow it down to maybe three. And so the first one was, uh, John, you mentioned about your, your funding partners. And I was wondering what are the opportunities for those folks who might not be able to fund, but can advocate like our federal government organizations and our individuals. So that's uh, one question. Um, the second question that I have is for Vignette about the investment and time frame it took for the Mar for the Marseille data center hub, and then the last question might not be very applicable, but just something I wanted to throw out there. You know, we have this infrastructure, and we're so and we're able to connect to other countries so quickly. Is anybody thinking about? Um, you know, so I'm here at NASA, and we're thinking about we are we are going to send astronauts back to the moon. We have, uh, you know, we have this space tourism industry that's coming up. Any thoughts about how we can connect to that industry? Because you know, as, as we develop space tourism, people are gonna wanna 
chat and they're going to want to take pictures and there's going to be, you know, we're going to start approaching the Zeta byte of data. And so any thoughts about that? And again, it might not be applicable. So those are my three questions. Thank you very much. Great questions, Julie. Okay. Recognizing that it is 1252 and I'm supposed to be moderating, maybe we could, um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, see if maybe we can just narrow down to one of those and I'm going to, um, take the choice. John has his finger up as if, if he needs to be the number one. I was actually not going to go to you, John. I was going to go to Vinay and ask how long Marseille really took, but, but since you, but you should, you should start since you are, you are the, uh, well, I just want to thank Julie for that softball. RVA 757 connects is a big tent organization and we want you specifically, yes. but we want everybody on this call that wants to get involved. There's a board of uh, CEOs and leaders of, of uh, academic institutions. But then there's also a mega region institutional council, which are the PDCs in both markets, the round tables in both markets, the community foundations in both markets. And, and that's a really important uh, part because we listen to them. They're the, they're the mic, they have the microphone. They tell us what to invest in, where we should go. And then they listen to our ideas and they say, oh, maybe you ought to rethink that or do that. And next year we're gonna stand up something called the um, Innovation Council, and that's going to be a, a really diverse group of people that are our innovative thinkers, people just like you. And so I want to get your help in standing that up. So thank you for raising your hand. John, I'm glad you you, you chimed in there. That's thank That you. was good stuff. Uh, Vinay, real quickly, do you, do you have a, any feedback on how long it took Marseille to go from zero to 60? Yeah, so... Um... I'll say this much that it's been, it's definitely been over a decade. The key development started in 2014 through 2020, where the subsea cables, um, the, with, the, uh, with the resurgence, we had more subsea cable, almost five new systems put in place during that time. And the capacity went from 90 terabits to 160 terabits. 2020 to 2024, again, over, so we're already in 20, towards the end of 2021. Another seven new cables are coming to the same place. So there will be 21 subsea cables by end of 2024 and 750 terabits per second capacity, um, which is 80 plus fiber pairs and over 200 networks. So it's taken, it's taken over a decade and the progression is continuing um, to happen. And by the way, one subsea cable to answer one other quick question there, one subsea cable investment, roughly speaking, is around $500 million. So you can do the math in terms of currently there are 15 of those there from an investment perspective. And yes, uh, DKICS as an interconnection platform is already working with SpaceX in getting internet connectivity and um, having robust interconnection platform in space. And Windsurf has already has an initiative, in fact, to connect uh, between Earth, Mars. Um, so it's, it's actually interplanetary uh, uh, <laughs> internet connectivity underway as well, not just in space, but we're looking at other planets as well. That takes subsea cables to a different perspective, yeah. doesn't it? Um, wow. Okay, so listen, we've got, uh, it's 1255. We are going to try and wrap by one. Um, I have, uh, I'm going to go to Greg Garrett next, who's been patiently waiting with his question. Um, Greg, if you could ask that real quickly to the, the group, that would be great. I will. And it's a question that uh, we've struggled with in many different ways. But what I saw was maps with Enrico, a map with Richmond. I see maps and discussion about Virginia Beach. Uh, are, who and where and when are we going to have a global discussion over how we can work together and go to places like New Kent that has lots of land, uh, go to places like Suffolk that have lots of land? How do we, when are we having the discussion in, in, instead of the competing with each other trying to figure out how we can do this on the grandest scale possible and cooperate, share revenues, do the things that Go Virginia is trying to get us to do. I don't hear that piece in this discussion and maybe I wasn't paying attention, but I don't hear that yet. And so what do we got to do to make that happen? I think that that is the perfect exactly. question to end on. Yes. Because we haven't addressed this. And all I keep thinking at my, at my marketing background is what's our brand? You know, how do we, how do we go to market with this, not just as Richmond, Henrico, Virginia Beach, et cetera, but as this, this global internet hub. But um, not just the branding question. It, it, well, but, you know, and then how do we, yeah. 
I'm going beyond the branding question to how can we say this is a designated area? Like here's a regional airport that's right. shared with multiple cities and counties, uh, and we all we don't treat it as the airport of one city. That that's the that is so branding and geographical consolidation of not cities and counties, but of a, a land of thousands of acres that we say this is the place we're all going to pour into and not compete with each other. Is that possible? Hmm. Absolutely. Well, I, I, um, if I had a magic wand, yes. Um, a lot of it's political will, yep. says the elected official here. Um, and so you've got to make sure that we, uh, to, to Julie's question earlier about advocating, um, you need to advocate to your local elected officials, the opportunity, the regional opportunity to the business community as well, to pressure the elected officials um, to, to get there. But, you know, I think now maybe, John, if you can come yeah. back on screen um, yes. and talk about what the next steps are, because I think yeah. that's, Greg, that's your point, right? What are the next steps? How do we take this great opportunity and capitalize on it um, beyond what we've been doing thus far? Great. And Amesa is going to help me and pull up just a couple of slides to, to wrap this up. But I first want to just thank everybody uh, for, for spending time with us this, this day and and really for all of our speakers um, and, and Andrew for your facilitation, just amazing content. Uh, and this is the first step, building this sort of awareness and then moving forward at really action. There's been a lot of work that's been going on for 10 years, but it's really all been in sort of the technology space. And now we're bringing it out to the economic development space and we're really gonna leverage that. So what's next? Well, they are, there are a number of things and this list is gonna keep growing in terms of what we have to do. But if you go to the next slide, uh, Amesa, you know, we're going to we're going to continue this outreach. This is just we had our board meeting a couple of weeks ago and the board said, oh, my gosh, this is the best secret that we've ever had. We got to like spread the word. So we're going to keep doing that and build awareness and, and showcase this cause through our marketing efforts and our website. And we'll send you that address. Uh, but we need to create a plan like Greg just teed up. We need to create a plan to go faster. So go Virginia officials, uh, Wilson Floor and, and Jim Spohr and uh, others involved are saying, wow, this is really something. And, and so in talking with Enrico County and Virginia Beach and then our friends all along the I-64 Innovation Corridor, we've got to put together a plan. We need to find out what is the secret sauce of those other 15 global internet hubs and formulate a strategic plan that, that maybe includes some kind of certification for all the jurisdictions and, and, and an education process so everybody benefits. There are no competitors here. The quicker we get up to speed with interconnection, the faster we become this global hub and the quicker we'll see more companies coming here. It starts with data centers, but then it goes into application designs. It goes into um, you know, developing software and that attracts tech workers. And then the tech workers attract more companies. It's, it's just a, an incredibly exciting success cycle and we've got to fuel it. And I think a, a webinar like this is just the spark. This is just igniting the potential here. So going to the next slide, uh, one of the things that we are gonna do real shortly on the uh, end of this month is have the second annual Convergence 2021. The two chambers of commerce are big players in the mega region. And, uh, and I would also say the Peninsula Chamber as well, but we're gonna have an event uh, from 10 to three in person in Williamsburg, and they're gonna, showcase, like we did last year, the work of RVA 757 Connects in general, but in particular, uh, we're going to talk about this global internet opportunity, and, and we're going to have a speaker from uh, a global internet hub really share how they built their hub from the ground up. So we're going to put on more events like this and uh, really want you guys to be on the ground, ground zero of spreading the word. So we want to make sure you get this internet paper that we've created. Uh, help us make that stronger, tell us what's missing in it, but also uh, become an ambassador and apostle for this incredible opportunity. This, this is our 21st century I-64 and 95. Uh, and you now are gonna be part of the transformation that it's gonna deliver. So thank you, thank you so much. And Sarah Jane, I'll turn to you for the, uh, for the goodbyes and close, thank you. Thank you, John. And please join me in a virtual, if you know how to do your virtual reactions, with a vir virtual round of applause for our panelists and our fantastic facilitator, Andrea McClellan. Thank you all so very much. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules today to learn more about this. It is our responsibility as leaders of these regions to make sure that this is successful. So please reach out to us, as John said. Please make sure you sign up for the RVA 
757 Connects newsletter to stay connected. We appreciate you. Happy Friday. And uh, again, uh, stay connected and stay tuned for more programming. Thank you so much for joining us.